My name is Bridget Sweet and I'm Associate Professor of Music Education at the University of Illinois in Illinois in the United States. Today we're going to talk about adolescent female voice change and it's important to remember that voice change does not happen according to a neat timeline. Uh, usually you see stages or symptoms of it starting around ages 10 or 11 for females and males and those can go into the mid-20s and so it really can be a long process for students to experience um, and so with that it's also important to remember that voice change is not just something that happens here for adolescents rather it is psychological it is emotional it is mental as well as physiological so as we move forward today I'd like you to remember voice change, keep, keep it in mind as a holistic experience for adolescent students. Um, this was supposed to be a workshop, and so I'm sad to not be actually interacting with you, but in a little bit, I'll pose some questions and encourage you to consider all that we're talking about today with regard to your own classroom and teaching setting and interactions with your students, um, kind of what has happened versus where you're going. There are a couple of disclaimers that I like to give first when I talk about voice change. And the first one is the idea that a person's sex depends on his or her genetic mapping. Two X chromosomes for a woman and XY for a man. But that sexual genotype does not necessarily correspond to the sex of the voice. The hormonal climate of the body determines the sex of the voice. In a female, estrogen and progesterone will produce a woman's voice. And in a male, testosterone will produce a man's voice. So with the understanding that there are documented cases of atypical hormonal levels and atypical chromosomal composition for some people, today we are discussing voice change of adolescents that fall within typical boundaries of hormonal levels, as well as typical boundaries of chromosomal makeup. I also have a great interest in people um, who identify as transgender, but limited time permits us from going in that direction. Um, the second disclaimer, there's a nice segue there, is that when I speak about female and male, I'm referring to assigned at birth female and assigned at birth male. And then the last disclaimer is that there are documented cases where a child's endocrine system never kicks in in the absence of testosterone prior to puberty gives a feminine voice with a range of three or four voice octaves and an impressive power and pulmonary reserve due to the XY musculoskeletal envelope. However, there are also documented cases where a child experiences severe malnourishment before puberty due to living in poverty. As a result, that endocrine system never fully develops and the body produces no secondary sex characteristics. So these cases are not um, wholly uncommon um, and result in this endocrinological castrato. So it does challenge the idea that every person goes through a voice change as it might suggest that voice change is a privileged development associated with a certain kind of situated able-bodiedness. So with all of this in mind, and with the idea of voice change as a holistic experience, away we go. As we move into discussions of voice change, I want to make sure that we understand the anatomy and physiology of the voice as we talk about voice change. Here you have um, a diagram of the body, which is very complex and amazing. And we have one tube that goes for our mouth all the way down to our stomach called the esophagus. And there's another tube called the trachea that goes from our sinuses all the way down to our lungs. And it's also known as your windpipe. And these two tubes are right next to each other, but serve very different functions in the body. But our students need to have understanding of the body just in general to avoid misunderstandings of their body and its function with the voice. So if I say to adolescents, you need to drink a lot of water prior to a performance, why would that be? I often get the response to keep my vocal folds wet. But that would be really bad because if your vocal folds are wet, that means that you're drowning because the water is down the wrong tube. You only want food and drink down your esophagus and you only want air transferred through the trachea. And so by discussing this with students, it does help them to understand. In addition, 
it's important that students understand, and you can see on this diagram where the larynx is located, and to help students find it, I say put your hand on your neck and say, ah, where it vibrates, that's where your vocal folds are housed, that's the walnut size house for your voice, the larynx, um, and it is part of the trachea. And we have to understand that this is actually a secondary organ in the body. And so if we are hydrating for a performance, we need to understand it's a secondary organ. And that as we intake water and hydration, um, it's gonna hydrate the brain or the heart or the kidneys or the lungs first before it goes to the larynx. So it's important that students understand you have to hydrate enough and far enough advance so that the body distributes all of that hydration and then has some left over to take care of our voice. These discussions of anatomy and physiology are very, very important for many reasons. Um, I encourage you to talk about that with your students if you're not. As mentioned earlier, the larynx is about the size of a walnut, which is not a very big house for our vocal folds. And in this image, you can see um, the front version of the larynx which would be if we were to peel all of the skin off of my neck, that's what that would look like, the thyroid cartilage being the frontmost part, which we tend to um, call the Adam's apple with male uh, singers after puberty. And then the top-down image would be if you were to cut off my head and look down my neck, that's what you would see. You would end up, if you went straight down that image, you would end up in my lungs. And you can see the vocal folds in the middle, which line up like this across the top of the trachea. And very simplistically, we can say that they zip and unzip as the air comes up from the lungs. Not unlike a Ziploc bag, but in reality, it's a lot more flowing and uh, rippling than just a simple zip and unzip for adolescents though. That's really all that they need to know at this time. And therefore that produces the sound of your voice. Now moving into the changing voice specifically, it's important to remember that voice change is most simplistically a growth spurt of the larynx. And for all students, they go through an anatomical readjustment of the larynx. Sometimes it is said that male voices change and female voices uh, develop, but everybody goes through a voice change. With the exception of my um, <clears throat> disclaimers at the beginning, of this workshop. Um, so the larynx enlarges in males anterior, posteriorly, front to back, which means that the thyroid cartilage extends outwards into that Adam's apple that we're familiar with after puberty for males. For females, the larynx enlarges more of a, a rounding shape, more up and down in the neck, so we don't tend to have an Adam's apple following. It's important to remember too that everything is operating normally in the larynx. The vocal folds are adducting like they normally do, but because in the size of a walnut, little growth means there's a big impact. And so when something on this side grows two millimeters more than this side, the alignment is off. And that posterior cartilage can't close all the way, which means that there is air getting through the vocal folds because there's no clean seal between them. That extra air, is creating a breathy sound and changing the color of the of the voice and it's also preventing phonation from happening on certain parts of the vocal fold. In addition to that, everyone grows through puberty. So again, with the exception of the disclaimers at the beginning, everyone experiences a voice change. That's important. And it's also really important to remember that voice change is unique for all males and all females. Some people have an easy time with it. Some people have a difficult time with it. Some people have a long voice change. Some people have a quick. And it doesn't matter, male or female, uh, regardless of sex, what the timeline is for that. Everyone experiences it on their own timeline. Not only does the larynx enlarge during voice change, but vocal folds elongate themselves. 
During the voice change process, female vocal folds elongate three to four millimeters, which results in a range downwards about a third of an octave and up three or four pitches from where they originally started. Male vocal folds elongate approximately 10 millimeters, which is one centimeter, range downwards, drops about an octave and moves up about a sixth. So if we're thinking within something the size of a walnut, that is significant growth. If you look at the end of a pencil, a number two pencil, the diameter of a number two pencil is seven millimeters. Female vocal folds typically are around nine to 13 millimeters when all is said and done. So female vocal folds are slightly longer than the diameter of a pencil eraser. Male vocal folds range between 15 and 22 millimeters and a dime is 17.9 millimeters across. So male vocal folds are approximately the diameter of a dime. These work really well to help students understand how small this organ really is and how intricate these parts are. A lot of times people just imagine the voice as this glowing orb and voice change being this magical thing that happens, but it's really scientific and it's easy to explain what is going on. I also like to use the analogy of a string instrument. Everybody starts with a violin, and then during voice change, females' instruments elongate to a viola. And if you ask any viola players, they will tell you that their instrument is not the same as a violin. They're two distinct instruments, but they're played similarly and they have similar timbre. However, males take their violin and elongate it to an upright bass, which has to be played differently, which is a completely different sort of sound and technique. But everyone following voice change ends up with a new instrument. And ultimately, all of our students need to understand that. So it was this time and the workshop that I had proposed for the Instrumental and Vocal Forum to have us stop and contemplate three core questions and write down some thoughts that we had about those questions. I'm gonna have you do that now, um, just to contemplate, and then we will revisit those over the next short bit. And I'm gonna take this opportunity to present a little bit further research that has to do with female voice change from the speech and hearing realms, as well as from music education. So the first question I'd like you to think about right now is how do or can I Acknowledge and honor adolescent female voice change in my music setting. The second question, how do or can I encourage confidence in female singers, especially during voice change? And the third question, what strategies or techniques might assist female singers struggling with symptoms of voice change? For females specifically, voice change can be a really challenging experience. First of all, it's largely unacknowledged in choral music education, and more on that in a moment. Singing can be extremely frustrating for females because their voice becomes breathy and thin, it loses color, flexibility, there's difficulty phonating on certain pitches, creating sounds, there's voice cracks. There's also a lot of fear about what will come out of mouths. And because of the lack of acknowledgement largely in our profession, there's also this sense of I'm the only one experiencing this, this feeling of isolation, um, and also these feelings of this is not normal because of not hearing that voice change is normal for female singers. In addition, females are too often diagnosed as an adolescent alto or adolescent soprano because changes in voice quality give the illusion that their voice is at one end of the spectrum or another. As such, I think it's important to remember that voice classification systems are tools to be used in the classroom and they're not the only tool. It's a little problematic, actually it's largely problematic, the strictness by which the profession of choral teachers tends to stick to voice classification systems as the, the answer to working with changing voices. Um, but in remembering that students are growing and their voices are developing well into their mid twenties, 
that when we have 11 and 12 year olds in front of us, that labeling can be dangerous as it contributes to um, locking in an identity as a singer, which then um, evolves into I'm an alto, therefore I cannot sing high or I am a soprano, so therefore I cannot sing low or bass or baritone or tenor, any of the voice parts. If we start labeling students in a way that promotes them locking into an identity at an early age, then it only leads to them being afraid and there's a lot of psychological and emotional ramifications as they move through their development as a singer because they believe that they can do and they believe that they can't do based on that label. I really promote the idea of developing musician skills as much as possible to move kids around on different parts constantly, have them sing a part up an octave or down an octave and have them really work on developing their ears and their voices. And then as voice change wraps up in the 20s, then take a look at specialization. But this idea of developing the musician as much as we possibly can during this stage of life and development is essential. I recently published the book, Thinking Outside the Voice Box, Adolescent Voice Change in Music Education, published by Oxford University Press. And this is, it's not a book of warm-ups. It's a book on adolescent voice change from all sorts of different perspectives, psychologically, physiologically, emotionally, socially. It is designed to be a holistic examination of the experience for adolescents to inform teachers about all of the parts and pieces that influence students during voice change, as well as all of the things that are influenced by voice change. And so I mentioned this because all that I am going to discuss for the rest of this video, as well as what has been previously been discussed, is covered much more at length within this book. So if these topics are of interest to you, this book might also be something to check out. There's a phenomenon that is called premenstrual vocal syndrome, PMVS, and it is discussed at length, which in speech and hearing sciences, as well as in vocal performance, but not in music education, especially not choral music ed. Uh, PMVS is what researchers have termed the collection of vocal symptoms that may result from premenstrual and menstrual tension. Other terms for this disorder are laryngopathia premenstruals, premenstrual dysphonia, and dysphonia premenstruals. Now what happens during premenstrual vocal syndrome is that concentrations of sex hormones are drastically altered during the premenstrual stage. Estrogen and progesterone levels decrease rapidly preparing for menstruation. From the dramatic shift in hormone levels, this sudden drop may alter the vocal folds through swelling, contributing to vocal fatigue, decrease in range, loss of power, faint hoarseness, loss of range, and loss of agility. In addition, all patients um, that have been studied with regards to PMVS show signs of edema, which is swelling of the vocal cords with thickened mucus and a loss of suppleness. And that results in like disturbed muscular vibratory function. Um, also issues with stamina. And there are also issues of abdominal discomfort that can lead to difficulty supporting vocal sound as well as emotional or mental blocks and an increase in acid reflux. This phenomenon was officially diagnosed by this study that you see here on this page. Um, the human larynx has been called a hormonal target organ. And in this study, this groundbreaking study of voice science, they determined that the same cells that make up sex organs in our body also make up our vocal fold tissue. To quote, in the author's study on uterine, cervical, and vocal fold smears, the pathologist is not able to distinguish between the two samples. Basophil cells have been observed on both slides. Therefore, there is a menstrual-like cycle on the vocal fold epithelium. In addition, in the book Diagnosis and Treatment of Voice Disorders, the fourth edition, there's a chapter called The Larynx, A Hormonal Target. And in this chapter, discussion of body temperature changes and resulting 
laryngeal nerve responses um, is discussed. So increased temperature before and after ovulation increases the velocity of the conduction of the nerve signal in the larynx. And at menses, there's a drop of body temperature, which decreases nerve conduction velocity. So as hormone changes, alter temperatures in bodies, in female bodies, it therefore speeds up and slows down laryngeal nerve response and, con and conduction of the nerve. So it's important to remember too that all of the research that we're discussing is focused on adult women with a regulated hormonal and menstrual cycle. And when we're working with adolescents, they are not at that regulation point yet. So hormone fluctuations are happening constantly and sporadically, which means that nerve uh, velocity uh, conduction the electrical signals in the, in, in the larynx are slowing down and speeding up in sporadic ways. And that swelling and stamina and all of these sorts of um, symptoms of premenstrual vocal syndrome are affecting students in middle and high school in sporadic ways. So not only are adolescent females experiencing laryngeal growth and experiencing vocal fold elongation, they are experiencing physiological change on a cellular level as their hormones fluctuate. Um, and so it is very important to acknowledge that not only do female singers experience voice change, they experience voice fluctuation on an incredibly um, complex level, which can lead to um, their voice feeling and operating differently on a daily basis. And that is a very, very powerful thing for our students to understand that your voice is going to be fluctuating as you're moving through puberty because of hormones. And, um, and therefore, this idea of encouraging students to advocate for themselves and speak up when their voices don't feel great is really, really important. Getting back to those core questions that I posed earlier, let's think about those answers again. How do or can I acknowledge and honor adolescent female voice change in my music setting? How do or can I encourage confidence in female singers, especially during voice change? What strategies or techniques might assist female singers struggling with symptoms of voice change? Think about how you would respond to each of these questions and then start to sort them into short-term strategies versus long-term strategies. Short-term, long-term. And we'll come back to these again. In 2015, I published the study, The Adolescent Female Changing Voice, a Phenomenological Investigation in the Journal of Research in Music Education. This piece was the first of its kind in that it was the first qualitative study that underwent research protocol and peer review to document the experiences of females during voice change. Much of what had been already published on the topic was more anecdotally gathered and put together from experiences of authors. I wanted to do a study that followed research protocol and really nailed down scientific evidence that this was a phenomenon that was occurring. And cutting right to the chase, what I found was that vocal challenges did exist for female singers during voice change, um, including lack of phonation in certain areas of vocal range, excessive breathiness and tone, vocal unpredictability, a lack of strength or endurance while singing, and so forth. And these challenges were identical to those that have been documented for adolescent male singers experiencing voice change. I also found that female singers self-identified with a voice part or voice range prior to laryngeal growth. I also collected evidence and 
documented the use of the words frustration and embarrassment and pride, eliciting emotions that were experienced during female voice change, the same descriptive words that were used by male singers describing their voice change experiences. And I also documented feelings of isolation for female singers during voice change, which were similar to those reported by males experiencing voice change. And in addition, female students reported in my study feelings of empowerment during occasions of vocal consistency and increased vocal function, which was analogous to male singers who also experienced empowerment in similar singing situations. In 2018, I published a second study on female voice change called Voice Change and Singing Experiences of Adolescent Females. This paper was published in the Journal of Research and Music Education. For this study, I interviewed college women to understand how adolescent female voice change impacted their singing experiences since the age of 11. Of the findings, two are especially poignant to mention today. The first revealed that vocal challenges during voice change manifested significantly in the participants' emotional and psychological responses to experiences, and then often resulted in negative self-perceptions and perspectives and insecurities about their singing abilities as adults. The second finding raised concerns of teacher influence and ensemble-centric considerations. For many of the choral teachers that my participants had, use these singers as mechanisms for maintaining the larger choir's well-being and place the needs of the choir above the needs of individual female singers. Ultimately, the study of mine revealed that many vocal challenges and needs of adolescent female singers are not acknowledged or met in choir, especially for those experiencing voice change. There are a couple of quotes that I would like to share with you. For example, Angie said, I think with boys in choir, it's so accepted that, oh, you're a tenor now, but in two years you'll be a bass. Where with girls, it's more like, oh, this is what you are when you're five, this is what you are forever. The second quote from Jessica, it feels incredible. I noticed that my solo height, access to higher notes, is unbelievably easier than it has been in my entire life. I have to think that part of it is because I'm not singing in the basement all day, every day because that's how it's been every day since seventh grade. In addition to these participants discussing um, their own experiences as singers, it was very clear from conversations that many of them do not think about their voice change as a long process, that it goes until the mid twenties. I had students that I talked to who felt that their voices had peaked at age 16 or 17 or 18 or 19. So they're not getting the message that their voices will continue to grow and develop. In fact, I interviewed one graduate student who said, I would say that only in the last two years of my life, now I'm 36, things have actually started to come together for me and I feel like the breath is connected to the resonance space and I can hit all the high notes and all the muscles are working together. So this person wasn't even feeling that culmination until their mid thirties. One more aspect of this study worth mentioning is that my participants trusted their teachers. They, the research shows that they trusted them at self detriment, that the participants were willing to self sacrifice their own vocal health and development rather than make a request such as, could I try that part? Because I've never sung that part before or even to say, this part is painful for me to sing. Could I try something different? The participants with whom I spoke very much looked upon their teachers as the trained and knowledgeable people. And the teacher wouldn't have me do something that they didn't think was important or safe or helping me. But it did stress the importance of singer self-advocacy and shine a light on the fact that singers are not advocating for themselves. Female singers are not advocating for themselves in choral settings. The final study that I would like to discuss with you was also published in 2018 with my colleague, Elizabeth Cassidy Parker, 
who is Associate Professor of Music Education at Temple University in Pennsylvania in the United States. This study is called Female Vocal Identity Development, a Phenomenology, and it was published in the Journal of Research in Music Education. In this study, we investigated influences on female vocal musicians' vocal identity development and how those influences shaped participants' futures as musicians and music educators. There are just a couple of the many findings that I would like to mention here. The first being others as powerful influences. Participants from this study identified choral and voice teachers in particular as powerful influences in labeling and reinforcing participants' emerging vocal identities. Choral teachers were consistently held in high esteem and participants describe how choral teachers generally enhance their enjoyment or involvement with the ensemble. However, participants noted that because choir teachers' focus remained on the ensemble rather than on individual singers, they felt that their voice part was related to or the result of the needs of the larger whole and how their individual voices contributed to the greater choir. As such, the participants with whom Dr. Parker and I spoke often expressed that they could or should not speak up about their assigned voice part as they feared responsibility for diminishing the larger choir. And I must make a point to mention that this is a different study from the one that I just discussed. This data set is different with different participants. And this finding about ensemble-centric considerations influencing the vocal development of female singers is emerging in two different studies. Another finding from this was that voice classifications were becoming permanent facets of vocal identity at very young ages. And there was a lot of fear, insecurity, pressure, and anxiety as a result of that as singers moved from early um, into voice change from early singers into adult singers. Um, majority of experiences singing were looked upon as negative and not positive. And there was much anxiety and self-consciousness and frustration as singers as adults based on feeling locked into a vocal identity uh, for so long. Again, earlier we talked about that. I'm this, so I can, which also means that I can't. And we found this in actuality and talking with singers. I think that um, ultimately this study showed that current teaching practices and student to teacher interactions influence female singers involvement with singing as well as the direction of their work as future music educators or performers um, and thinking about how we are setting off ripple effects in our profession with female singers and what sorts of habits want to be we want to be perpetuated with regard to how female singers are advised and taught and empowered in classrooms these three research studies provide a lot of insight on these considerations i have a friend here who has been very patient as i've put this video together during this quarantine his colleague bailed on us so this is luke my son and what we would like to do is to wrap things up for us today and bring back those core questions. How do or can I acknowledge and honor adolescent female voice change in my music setting? How do or can I encourage confidence in female singers, especially during voice change? And what strategies or techniques might assist female singers struggling with symptoms of voice change? While we can't ponder these things in person together, and I really, really would still love to have that conversation with you, there's a few things that I send you forth to consider as you move back into your own classrooms. The first being, honor and celebrate voice change. Honoring and celebrating voice change for all singers. Is it always easy? No. no. <laughs> but celebrating successes and victories wherever you can is important. And it's happening whether we want it to or not. So let's embrace it and celebrate it rather than fight and dread and be frustrated by it. Secondly, approach changing voices individually. Good. 
Voice change is the growth spurt of the larynx. It's a unique process for all, and some singers will struggle with it more than others, regardless of sex. Avoid making assumptions of vocal challenge or vocal severity based on the sex of student alone. Discuss voice change often. Normalize it. So without talking about it and weaving it into the fabric of your classroom, it won't become something that's expected and something that's normal. Everyone's going through puberty. Everyone's experiencing a voice change. Everybody will work through something, whether it be short and easy or long and challenging. But we're all in this together. And that is really the message that needs to be sent to students right from the very beginning. We can do it. Encouraging self-advocacy is really, really important. Helping students make use of their figurative voice with regard to their literal voice and stand up for themselves. If it doesn't feel good, they should feel empowered to say something. If they want to try something new, they should feel empowered to talk to you about that. And last but not least, with great power comes great responsibility. Beware of ensemble-centric considerations in your classroom. Really work to place the needs of your individual female singers over the needs of the choir. So ultimately, all student voices should be honored and attended to, regardless of gender and regardless of enrollment number. Meeting the needs of changing female voice singers is similar to meeting the needs of changing male voice singers. As musicians and music teachers and conductors, we must be overtly supportive we must approach each student's voice change process individually and validate their physiological, mental, and emotional experiences. We must inform and educate all of our singers on the voice change process, stressing the importance of healthy singing at all times. Every one of our singers are going to pass through puberty at some point. Part of our job as choral music educators and conductors of adolescents is to help the singers, both male and female, navigate vocal transitions and growth as smoothly as possible and as positively as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.